<clears throat> Welcome to my new calculus channel. My name is John Gabriel. And in today's lecture, which is lecture three, we're going to be talking about the misconceptions, uh, the mainstream misconceptions in mathematics. So let me just close this window here. Right. So uh, previously we looked at uh, we looked at the first uh, two chapters, which dealt with a brief history of the most relevant events and what it means for a concept to be well defined. Okay. So, and what we'd really like to do now is just look at a few of the main misconceptions in mainstream mathematics. So, <clears throat> you know, the, the most important uh, misconception in mainstream mathematics is the fact that no academic before me actually understood what the number concept means. In other words, they had no idea that a number describes the measure of a magnitude. They just had vague ideas of what is meant by the concept of number. And because of their, their clouded minds and their hazy thinking, they, <clears throat> they failed to understand the elements of Euclid and what Euclid was attempting to write down in a perfect way. Well, that was the most important task in which they failed. And because they were not able to understand the five requirements, which they called axioms, I guess it's very easy if you don't understand anything just to call it an axiom because you can't refute it. But that isn't how well-formed knowledge uh, leads to any understanding or progress in mathematics. So um, this misconception that axioms were needed in mathematics be, took root in the mainstream academia. So all the morons who came before me decided that you couldn't do math without axioms. Of course, if you try to uh, define all of geometry without axioms, <laughs> you, you'll without with, with their first order logic axioms, the ZF uh, axioms and the piano axioms and all that other garbage, you'd have a really difficult time doing that because geometry does not require axioms. All the Greek geometry theory can be derived from nothing, from a complete blank slate. It does not require faith or beliefs or religion or any of that nonsense. <clears throat> and in the following videos, I'll show you how to derive all these five requirements from nothing. But since a number is the building block of mathematics, it's no surprise that, you know, we, we've seen such a lot of rubbish uh, take hold in the last few hundred years. And moreover, mainstream academics have not really understood the basic geometric concepts. So for example, this little point or dot you see here is not a point. It's just a visualization of the idea of location. In other words, where is it? Oh, it's here, or it's here, or it's here. Okay, so it just denotes a location. It's not a point, because a point is the concept of location. Similarly, this straight line you see here is not a line. A line has no width, okay? It has no uh, broadness. A line is a distance between two points. That's what it is. And a straight line is the shortest distance between two points. There is no such thing as an infinite line. That's absolute rubbish, which you've learned and has been brainwashed in the mainstream uh, methods of teaching. Okay, so there is no such thing as an infinite anything, in fact. Okay, so a line 
is a finite distance between two points. That's exactly what is a line, and that's what the elements says. Also, this uh, shape here that you see here is not a circle. <laughs> it's just the idea or the visual visualization of the perfect object, the perfect geometric object, right? So, you know, it's, it's kind of amazing that even today, uh, uh, most academics don't understand these things. They simply use these objects here and call them circles and straight lines and points without actually understanding what these things here mean, okay? And this is what Euclid had tried to explain, but didn't really do such a great job. Even in, in my opinion, he didn't do such a great job. But for example, a triangle is the shortest distance joining any three distinct locations in the universe and the quadrilateral, any four distinct locations. And the circle is the shortest distance joining all the locations that are equidistant from a given center in a plane. So that's what a circle represents. It represents this concept here of shortest distance joining all the locations equidistant from a given center. I mean, this, this here could be a circle. Watch my mouse. This could be a circle if it wasn't defined in this particular way, right? And we'll see more of that later. Now, <clears throat> the second most important concept is that of arithmetic mean. Every number is not only a rational number, but it's also an arithmetic mean. And so... We'll see later on that without the arithmetic mean, you can't integrate. You can't calculate areas, you can't find volumes. You can't do any of that advanced calculus that you're taught at university because that requires products of arithmetic means, okay? The area is a product of two arithmetic means and the volume of three. So I don't want to spend too much time on it. You can read through this, but the next big misconception is that there is such a thing as an infinite series, but there isn't, neither potential nor actual. So when we write an expression like this, we mean a partial sum, which may or may not necessarily converge. And you'll hear ignorant academics talk about the Cauchy criterion for infinite series. Now, the Cauchy criterion is really just See, it's really just uh, a very obvious statement about a convergent series, right? And, and you can't use it, by the way, unless you know the limit. <laughs> okay, so you need to know the limit to be able to uh, use this criterion to see if it converges. And contrary to what many academics think, if you don't know the limit, the Cauchy criterion is absolutely useless, okay? See this L here? It means the limit. Now, uh, for example, you need to have, uh, for every epsilon greater than zero, there must exist uh, an N greater than, a big N greater than zero, such that when this distance is less than epsilon, such, su such that this distance is less than epsilon whenever N, little n is greater than big N. So we, we can, you know, make this, uh, n as big as we like, but it mustn't be smaller than the n that we choose to satisfy this inequality. Now, we could obviously make that e bigger or smaller, and then it would work, right, if you make it smaller. So we can always choose a smaller one, but we can never have a situation where n is zero, okay? And so this criterion here relies on the fact that you can find a value which is always greater than a particular tail part of the series. And there's really nothing complicated about this, and it doesn't make calculus rigorous one bit even. Okay, but this is uh, typically what more on academics tend to talk about whenever they say, oh yeah, calculus uh, was made rigorous, but it wasn't. You still do not have a systematic way of finding the derivative. Okay, so for example, uh, remember we talked about in a previous uh, video about the fact that concepts 
uh, should never be defined in attributes uh, which they do not possess? Well, guess what? The mainstream definition is defined in terms of every finite difference except the one which matters. Okay, so when we're looking at this function here, um, you have this particular limit here to give you the derivative derivative at a point, but h cannot be zero. Okay, because if it's zero, then it's actually the derivative function, right? So you have this different quotient, difference quotient here, which is defined as you see here. And in order to get to this particular derived function, it has to be zero, zero, but it cannot be zero, zero. So in your bogus mainstream calculus, you do not have a systematic way of finding the derivative. You've just got some monkey business, like what you do here, by considering everything except the, uh, the finite, you consider all finite differences except the one that matters, which is that h is equal to zero, right? So evidently, mainstream orangutans have never understood what it means to be a well-defined concept and had no idea. So um, this here just shows you in very plain and simple terms, and you can choose any function you like. Uh, choose x cubed like that and then you'll see again the derivative is this line here but <laughs> see you can take any other h that you like and none of these h's actually matter <laughs> the only one that matters is the one when it's equal to zero and you can't have h is equal to zero in your bogus definition all right so let's close that don't need it anymore and so the Cauchy criterion uh, also takes different forms. For example, in terms of a sequence, we'll see it stated this way. But if we're looking at a particular function, then it will be stated in this format here. So it's more or less the same, but not quite. And again, the same thing happens here. Um, all we're doing is we're considering what happens as we approach the point of tangency, a particular point of tangency. So, uh, and this shaded region here is the, the area in which this condition, this inequality, or the first order logic statement needs to hold. But it's still a problem, okay? Again, if H is zero, whoops. Okay, let's just click on there and go to zero. I'm going the other way now. If we go to zero, <laughs> that finite difference is no longer valid. You see the green line is the finite difference. But once we hit, hit zero, it's gone, right? <clears throat> and this here requires that you know the limit again. If you do not know the limit, you're stuck, you're screwed, so to speak. And how do you find the limit? Using your bogus method, you do not have a systematic method in your mainstream calculus. The first principles method is monkey business. Did you get that? In other words, it's bogus because you cannot set h equals to zero ever. And your lecturers will tell you that and your priests who are sitting on top of the academic tr trash heap will tell you the same thing. So this whole theory here has never been rigorous. It's, it's a joke. It's always been a joke. And you've been brainwashed if you believe it, if you believed in this joke, okay? So now, um, in this chapter here, I describe what the Cauchy criterion is and I go through and explain uh, why you're able to use it to determine a series is convergent, provided you know the limit. Of course, if you don't know the limit, then you have a problem because you still need to know information about a particular function in order to determine whether it is convergent or not. And so an infinite series is equivalent to a series with a general term and possibly a sum to n terms. So it's just represented by a partial sum followed by an ellipsis. There's nothing infinite about it. And it's unfortunate that Newton, Isaac Newton chose to call his 
partial sum series with an ellipsis following it, an infinite series. There's nothing infinite about it, and the limit doesn't care if the terms are all there or even there at all. Okay, so I've talked quite a bit about this and shown you a few demonstrations. Um, and I didn't actually get to this, but this here is a, a continuation of the previous applet. Um, finally, you can actually show that the limit is true using my statement of this limit theorem, uh, which the morons in mainstream academia rejected. But if you prove this once, you never have to worry about proving any limits anyway. And it's easy to prove this geometrically, see? And it works for everything. This is the beauty of the theorem. When you move closer to the point of tangency, the area of the circle gets close to zero, see? And it doesn't matter what curve it is. You can choose any curve that you like. You can type down a different curve in here, okay? You can say f of x is equal to x squared, right? And again, you see, if you move the red point away, the circle will increase indefinitely, the circle area. But once you get closer and closer, it'll be zero. And so that takes care of the fact that uh, a limit exists at that point. And it's stated beautifully in this theorem, which I have graciously shared with the morons in mainstream academia. Okay, so if you prove this and you understand what's happening here, then you never need to work with another epsilon delta proof again as far as a function is concerned because it's all being done for you here. Yes? Okay. So now, let's close that up. I don't need that anymore. Um, I will be talking about the derivation of the actions and the postulates from scratch in the next episode, hopefully, which will be produced sometime in the next few days. I hope that you've enjoyed this little presentation and that you'll join me again next time for another video. My name is John Gabriel. This is a new calculus channel. Till next time, goodbye.